So this is Robin Harford from eatweeds.co.uk and foragingcourses.com. I am here today with two characters. Do you want to introduce yourself, what your names are? I'm Vicky, Vicky Chown. Um, and, and I'm Kim Walker. And you are both the authors of a brand new herbal book called... The Handmade Apothecary. So what's your story? I mean, what, what, tell us a little bit about you. What's your background? Are you just kind of... Um, folk herbalists are you qualified herbalists we are both qualified medical herbalists we both studied at the university of westminster which is actually where we met but we've got quite different backgrounds in terms of how we interacted with herbs as children and our journey with herbs kim tell yours (laughs) (laughs) so i was brought up in uh, scotland and in the middle of nowhere in an ancient piece of woodland that's used to stretch all all the way to across Europe so it was a really ancient lichen dripping beautiful tree based uh, cottage and I guess that's where I found my love for plants but when I was 18 I moved all the way up to London and um, went around the city working for London Stock Exchange and having a crazy 20s And at some point during my late 20s, I thought, oh, I really need to start healing myself. I've been a bit wild. And so I enrolled onto herbal medicine and uh, have been with the plants ever since. Yeah, so Kim had a really nice, pretty kind of countryside. Her grandmother, you didn't mention, but your grandmother also practiced quite a bit of folk medicine using herbs. But I I grew up in a really kind of rundown part of North London, um, surrounded by concrete. And I don't really understand where I got my love of herbs from. I just know that ever since I was a very small child, I loved being outside and I loved being in green spaces and picking dandelion heads and making potions from them. And I, I loved all of the folklore behind um, behind plants, which kind of led me down my own healing path and led me to enrol at the University of Westminster as well, yeah. Yeah, I guess that shows the two sides of the way uh, people can come towards plants. One is being part of it from a young age and never wanting to let it go. And the other one is a reaction to living in a concrete jungle. And... Um, or just an innate yeah. an innate need for it, you know, as, as humans, as part of nature. It's just, mm-hmm. I needed it. I, I, even now, I need country fixes. I know people who live in the country, so they need city fix. I need country fix. I need to get out in the green, even if it's a green space within London. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think that's true. I went, I worked as a temp in London Stock Exchange and I think this was a really significant moment and it was, you can imagine it was manic and I was getting up at, you know, five in the morning to get there and after six weeks, they, it was temping and they offered me a full-time job and I just went, no, no way. <laughs> and I walked straight out there and <laughs> signed up for college instead to uh, at Cape Manor, which is a lovely horticultural college and stayed with the plants. <laughs> so... How did the idea for the, the book come about? The title of it again being? The name of our business, which is The Handmade Apothecary. Right. Um, well, me and Kim started working together after, after we finished university. I think I was still in my last year and Kim had finished. Um, and we started doing something that we didn't get at university, which, which was more of the practical foraging side of things. We, didn't, we did a lot of clinical training, a lot of science training and research-based stuff, but we didn't get the hands-on herbalism that we really wanted, that we thought we'd get. So we started going out. Kim's really interested in botany. We're both very interested in plants um, and just foraging for ourselves uh, and then decided to teach others how to do the same. So that's how our company, The Handmade Apothecary, started. Um, and just so happened that along the way we got um, invited to be in the Evening Standard newspaper as a feature because a lot of and the Ham and High because a lot of our walks are in the North London which area which is a newspaper yeah the Ham and High newspaper um, <clears throat> and we were spotted by a publisher called Kyle Books who asked us to write them a book right and that was always on the cards we mm-hmm. always said we wanted to write a book but we thought it'd be 20 years down the line when we were old ladies and we were old hands at it um, so it's a bit of a shock, but we grabbed it with both hands. Yeah, we, it's something you can't really turn down. And so we sat down and went, OK, let's write a book then. So is it... I mean, there's, there's differences of herbalism, you know. There's so many books out there that are just... They just t- glance over things. They're really just kind of eye candy, you know, mm. when it comes to 
to herbal medicine and you kind of get dribs and drabs and they're, they're, I suppose the word is superficial they're pretty mm. superficial but it sounds like from, from previous discussions with you that this is a book that basically you wish you'd had mm. when you first started out we often found that we'd have to buy five books to kind of learn the basics of herbal medicine. So what we wanted to write is a book that encompassed all the things we were looking for when we first started our kind of herbal journey. Um, so it, it gives a bit about foraging, it tells about um, how to make your own remedies, how the holistic sense of it in terms of how the body works as well is really important but not it doesn't just touch on it we do quite go in quite in depth it's a 60,000 word book but it's also very pretty so we managed to get this really we're quite proud of the balance there a lot of people say it's really beautiful it could be a coffee table book but it's got the information in there too so don't be fooled by the pretty pictures it does have a hell of a lot of meaty meaty stuff in there yeah we had a fantastic photographer who was just totally on point about everything every time we turned up with plants she'd put them on the table we'd work with it and it would just work out her name was Sarah Cuttle and we also had an amazing editor who managed to somehow put everything we wrote in those 60,000 words in a pretty order and fit with a picture and that's a really hard thing to do yeah um so yeah very lucky for that so how many plants do you cover in the book I think it's 80 something really? at least wow. that wow. but we've also got we should know the answer to that but we've got Never culin- culinary herbs as well okay. so and then also there's herbs that are kind of popped into a recipe but don't necessarily have a, a full um, monologue on them yeah so monograph sorry not monologue Is it, yeah, yeah. We, we probably counted at the beginning but since then we've took out and put in and we haven't actually sat down and counted but it must be 80 to 100 it's a hell of a lot wild wild and home gro- wild, lots of wild plants that you can find in your local environment and also ones you can grow at home including urban environments as well which is quite important and ones that you can find in the in the in the supermarket funny enough because what we wanted to do is make sure it was accessible yeah. so all of the plants that we covered think even things like garlic and ginger okay you're probably not going to grow that at home maybe garlic not so much ginger um but you can use them from the supermarket to you know help a cold or an, a bacterial infection for instance so they're readily available to exactly to gather i mean some of the ones that you go out and forage for are they kind of harder are they more kind of they're not like you can't just pop into a herbal depository and pick them up they are ones that you'd have to actually go out and gather no not at all uh, i think okay. we've mainly chosen ones that you know we're writing it to make it accessible to all sorts so even if you don't have time to forage very often, if you did want some herb, you should be able to get them from a local herbalist as well, or from mm. a you know a herb shop. Another but they thing. are also <coughs> available for foraging. So another thing that we did was emphasise how to store and prepare your herbs so that you can go and do one day of foraging um, and collect maybe five plants and and store them in such a way that you can use them throughout the year. So, for instance, elderberry cordial, you can make that into a mixture with sugar which preserves it and you can use that for about you keep that for easily a year in the cupboard mm-hmm. yeah. and it can be used for any kind of immune immune problem so when you have a cough or a cold or if your immune system is feeling a bit low it can be used for so many things so yeah so it a lot of a lot of herbal books are i've got a sniffle and a snot cold so i can go and take i don't know some like i don't know i don't know yarrow or something you could use Yarrow. <laughs> but you seem to be approaching it, I mean, this word holistic. Mm. So what does that mean? Because a lot of people with, with a perception of herbal medicine, um, one, they can often confuse you with homeopathy. Yeah. And also they see plant medicinal plants as like a pharmaceutical drug. So mm. I've got a headache, so I'll go and take an, an aspirin. Mm. Um, but medicinal plants don't, they kind of can work in a symptomatic way, kind of what I call mm-hmm. crash mm-hmm. medicine. Yep. Which is but fine for acute things, like you've got a sore throat. Fine for an yeah. immediate yeah. situation, but it's a little bit more rounded than that, it seems. We give a background on the body systems. So, for instance, I think we mentioned... What we should go into, one of my favourite examples is headache. A lot of people say, I suffer from headaches, what can I take? And I say, oh, well, if you want to take something now, have a painkiller. Yeah. And that's what a doctor would give you. But actually... As a holistic therapist, if we sit down, normally I give um, a first a first consultation would be an hour 
even up to two, we sit down and we go through everything. We look at your lifestyle, your family history, your um, digest, all all of your body systems. And it could be due to the fact that you have too much stress at work. You're sitting in a funny posture. You've got neck tension. You've got high blood pressure. It could be digestive issues. So there are so many things that could contribute to you having a headache. And taking a painkiller will take away the pain, but it won't necessarily heal a long-term problem of headaches yeah. you want to find out maybe you have inflammatory bowel disease and it's affecting your your headaches maybe that's what we need to fix first so that's the idea of holism yeah in herbal medicine yeah so in the book it's saying to people to kind of uh it's it's kind of looking at the the beginnings of when you first start looking at body systems and starting to understand what might be causing things and having a little sit and think about yourself as well uh, before you just treat symptomatically. But we were also realistic, you know, we wanted to say to people, you can treat yourself to a certain degree, but eventually it needs to be a degree for you to treat yourself. So sometimes we say, you, if it's this problem, you should go and see a herbalist to get to the bottom of it, because they are experts in their field, just like a doctor would be. Just like, you know, if someone had cancer, we wouldn't say, hey, eat this leaf, go and see a doctor. Absolutely. So there's, there's definitely a practical element to it too. Um, and we try to give that advice as much as we can. <laughs> yeah, I think that's important because I often get people who come on my walks and I talk about metal roots and prostate mm. health. And I have a number of people who, who email guys, obviously, mm. who email me and they say, well, are there any plants that I, I've just been diagnosed with prostate cancer? Mm. You know, mm. We get that a lot stage, too. Is there any plants? And my immediate response is, well, first off, I'm, I'm not a medical herbalist. Mm. And secondly, it's not something you would self-medicate over. No, you no. need to go and see a professional. Exactly. So there is a place for kind of home, the home herbalist mm -hmm. who treats their kids and some of their friends and neighbours and whatever. But then there's the more chronic conditions yes. which do need an expert. Mm -hmm. of course. But what's uh, the key for that is, you know, if you do have something like a serious condition, it is all about educating yourself. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, you can find out what could help you support other treatments um, but it's about education as well knowing your body knowing what's normal for you and what's normal for us as kind of human race is really important and it is something that we're quite passionate about a lot of we feel it should be taught more in schools a lot of people don't know when it's time to see a doctor and when it's not mm. yeah and that can be a really tricky thing for a lot of people some people over uh, are over sensitive and go to doctors for everything and some yeah. people hold back for very important things with an overstretched nhs as well and you know there's a really problematic future of serious antibiotic resistance if people are going to the doctor and demanding antibiotics for a virus which doesn't treat a virus you've got a big problem there but if people are a bit more empowered about their own health and they know what kind of simple home remedies they can use in what appropriate situation then that's going to help everybody all around yeah i mean i know that i i work with a herbalist who shall not be named <laughs> who um who works with the kind of the House of Commons and the House of Lords and the government in kind of all that whole regulatory side. And one of the problems with the National Health, with there not being money, he told me that the statistics were that 50% of people that go into an NHS doctor's mm -hmm. surgery are there for purely social contact, mm -hmm. so they're isolated. Mm -hmm. The next 25% are there for a sniffle and snot cold that your book and, and you know, herbalists like yourself could, could teach everyday people to, mm -hmm. to self-manage their own health care. Um, and then the final 25% are actually the people who need to be in the doctor's surgery. So you've got 75% of people in a doctor's surgery who don't need to be there. It's mm. absurd. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? So, I mean, one of the things when you start talking body systems, it's kind of like, oh my God, bodily systems. And I'm immediately seeing men in, generally men in white coats. <laughs> skeletons and, and pictures of internal organs and it's like whoa that's like um, I'm immediately freaked out mm. well that's how we were trained we were trained as as clinical kind of as clinical herbalists so yeah. we, we do have a really good understanding of how the body works so but how have you translated that academic tyranny of the cranium as I love to call it mm -hmm. into yeah. something that everyday people can relate to that's one of the problems is you've got that division between the experts mm. that you go to for your health and a lot of people don't have any real knowledge of what their bodies are saying to them. Don't even know where their spleen is. No. no. Where's, your, where's no. your liver? And oh. that's, yeah, yeah, that's not their fault. It's something that needs to maybe be addressed in education for people to just really understand their health, whether it's, um, you know, at school, primary school and high school. And um, 
that's what we're doing in the book is trying to get people to be a bit more empowered about themselves yeah. and of course if they were then there wouldn't be that problem would there be about 75 percent of an overstretched nhs because you know the nhs is a fantastic service of course. a free medical care yeah. and really you know amazing um discoveries in medicine that have really changed humankind yeah you know you know infant mortality and, and life expectancy has really expanded but you know people do need to be a little bit less handheld and yeah. i think that's one thing i noticed between britain particularly when we have people from europe all over whether it's poland or france or sweden they, they come, come on the walks, walks yeah. they actually go oh yeah i recognize this tree we use this a lot you yeah. know everybody goes out and picks it in the summer yeah. and it, we use it for this and they don't even realize they're doing that as yeah. a herbal medicine self-care thing and they seem to have really maintained this oral tradition of um, going out and getting plants, which is really closely linked with uh, food and health, yeah. which we seem to have really lost over here. And if it's to do with us being an island and, and different politics, I don't know what it is, but we need to take some lessons on from Europe. Yeah, I find it, I find it you know, because I travel a lot, so... I feel when when I'm in Europe, I feel there's more connection when I'm in villages and mm -hmm. I watch the old people going out and I'm seeing them gathering plants. Mm -hmm. It's just it's kind of a second nature. It's just mm -hmm. like part of the culture of what is done. Mm -hmm. And even just in somewhere like like um, Italy or Spain, you know, when I visit, it's like wow, we really don't have that mm -hmm. actually in the British Isles. No. We, we, I don't, it, and I'm sure it's got something to do with us being an island. Being an state island, yeah. <laughs> and but, and then, then when I go into, say, Southeast Asia, where they're even more out, mm. you know, oh, and they, just they have to do it out of necessity <laughs> still, whereas in Europe it's just more a cultural thing. It's not a necessity per se. It's just what people choose to do. But in, in Asia and Africa, you know, they have to do it. And it's like... Every time I come back to Britain, I just, I kind of like, I'm really, I'm quite down about just how disconnected yeah. we are to, to, to such a, such commonplace practices that we used to be very connected to. I guess it's to do with our complex history. And just mm. to think, all this knowledge that people hold in Europe, we had to go to university for. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know it's yeah. crazy, your, your isn't it? grandmother didn't teach you or your mother no. didn't yeah. teach you. But, uh, yeah, we've got a complex history of witch burning, I guess, and uh, yeah. being scared of wise women and, and regulatory, regulation of medicine, which in some cases is handy because of safety and really understanding herbs to get new medicines. But people should be more in touch to be able to go out and say, I've got you know, a headache or a sore throat or I can't sleep. I can just, oh, there's a tree over there I can pick it from. And instead yeah. of having to wait six weeks for a doctor's appointment and then you know, maybe getting some help or not. Yeah. Especially with chronic conditions. You know, there's not um, a great deal of uh, success that people find for things like PMS and period pains yeah. over mm. time, except maybe painkiller or other things like autoimmune diseases. I mean, there are great treatments, but sometimes the best experts on this are the patients themselves. Yeah. And herbal medicine really works very well with kind there of conditions supporting. There are some supporting. real areas where herbal medicine really excels, and it really like, the immune system, as you said, lots of hormonal issues. That yeah. Gynecology. Because herbs have this amazing way. Not all herbs, but a lot of herbs have this amazing way of being synergistic in the body, and they kind of just go in and do their thing. And the mechanism sometimes aren't even fully understood by science, even though they've been well studied. They just go in and balance. So, for instance, hawthorn, which is a flower that's out now, we use it for for blood pressure and I was going to say high blood pressure but it's actually regulatory so it goes in if you've got high blood pressure it can lower it and if it's if you've got low blood pressure it can it can raise it feel like ginseng in that it's sense amazing it's, uh, like it's an, an adaptogen, adaptogen. It's an we call it adaptogen yeah. so it adapts the body it adapts the, the body state to modulates what it needs. yeah and it's just unbelievable how that works and stuff that's very sensitive like the immune system and like the hormonal system whereas so, so say you had uh, polycystic ovaries syndrome um the doctor would probably put you on a pill that suppressed all of your natural hormones and gave you some extras um which can cause havoc and it can help a lot of women's symptoms but as soon as you come off the pill you're back to square one especially yeah. if you want to conceive you're back to square one and you can have lots of problems but there are herbs that can really really balance that out for you and actually work to getting your, your body into a much better state of being um and that's, that's something that is very difficult to learn. It took us, it took, I don't know about you, Kim, but it took me years of university to realise that that was how herbs worked and just to kind of sit back and relax and, and trust them yeah. a bit. Um, 
Yeah. But in the book, we basically, in, in short of your question, we tried to make it as easy to understand for people as possible and we tested it out on family members and friends and said do you know we've written about the reproductive system it's quite a uh, complicated system do you understand this and we got lots of feedback because being kind of a bit more of an expert in your field it's very easy to um overcomplicate things yeah see the wood for the trees exactly so we made it as simple as possible without dumbing it down yeah 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 Yeah, i mean it's it i was quite amazed because obviously we're in london as listeners can hear by the, the kind of traffic and aeroplanes <laughs> that are going on and birds and birds yeah, and, and <laughs> <of course. laughs> yeah the rest of the non-human world and i was teaching yesterday with a medical herbalist doing a wild food wild medicine day and we had two gps on it mm, we do often yeah and one of these gps who we ended up just kind of going out and having a, a drink with um was was extraordinary it seems like they it seems that there's a, a breed of younger, yeah. really bright young things like you guys, you know, coming in. And although she's a traditional GP, she's also incredibly open to, mm-hmm. to nutrition, predominantly that. nutrition. <laughs> and that she, you know, she, one of her first biggest frustrations with, with patients when they come in into the surgery is they just want to be given something. Mm. They, and they'll come in and go, just give me antibiotics yeah. for my cold. And, and she's going, Actually, I'm not going to give you antibiotics. Now, for a doctor to say, no, I'm not just going to give you antibiotics, actually. We're going to start looking at you a little bit differently. That, that gives hope that mm. actually there, there is possibly some, some shifting going on. I think predominantly because the NHS is so overtaxed mm-hmm. that, mm. you know, the, the more wise new young doctors coming through now uh, recognizing the power of nutrition, the power yeah. of plant medicines, and There's getting been some great programs, trying to well. educate yeah. the the general public that this is how how we have to go. Because it doesn't matter how angry we get that the NHS is is failing people and is is basically going bankrupt. The reality is what the reality is, and so we can either sit and be a victim and whine about oh, the state's not providing for my health care anymore, or we can take control of our, of our own health care and start learning about plants as medicine and yeah. plants as food. And often there's, there's a, you know, that boundary of, oh, that plant is medicinal and that, food is, that plant is for food is mm. very blurred. Mm. You know, so. And that's a two-way street. If people start to help themselves, and they are helping the NHS by not going for minor of complaints. They are. So that would be the ideal situation, I guess. And... Mm. I think there's been a lot of research in recent years about this kind of uh, qualitative, um, like not just does this drug help people, but also as, as looking at people's lifestyles and things that people can help themselves. So doctors are looking into that more and, and saying, OK, I'm not going to give the antibiotic. And I think as more and more research grows, that will be more accepted, and it is happening. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the attitudes of people as well. As a, as a practicing herbalist, you get some patients who are not willing to make any changes dietary. They mm-hmm. won't. They won't stop and they smoking. Do just want a pill. And they yeah. want. And they say, well, "Give me, fix. give me something." And you go, "Well, I can give you something, but it's not going to f- change the fact that you're allergic to gluten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if you keep eating gluten, there's nothing I can do for you. I can help help you as much as I can, but I can't stop your allergy in total. So yeah, it's about social." social kind of ideas and the fact that people need to take control of their own health as well to, to kind of wrap and pack the interview what how do people get in, in touch with you because you know I've, I've the reason one of the reasons I'm interviewing you folks is because you know I get really good feedback and hear about you through other people about one your knowledge base to your ability to put that knowledge over in a really in in to make complexity really simple to teach people about plant medicines. So how do people, have you got a website that people can find you on? Yeah, it's uh, www.handmadeapothecary.co.uk. Okay, and, um, the, and the name of the book is Handmade Apothecary. It's also it called, is. yeah, the book's called The Handmade Apothecary, but our website's handmadeapothecary.co.uk, yeah. and we have Instagram and Facebook and Twitter as well, so people can find us on there as Handmade Apothecary. Okay, that's really cool. 
All right, well, thank you, folks. Thank oh, you thank for having you. us. Yeah. It's lovely yeah. talking to you. Pleasure. Yeah. <laughs>